Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today our guest is the author of a book that moved me so deeply I just had to invite him on our show. At the age of 13, this young, misunderstood Irish boy decided he could no longer tolerate the constant abuse and bullying he was subjected to at home and school. So he ran away and lived with a pack of stray dogs for three years. The lessons he learned about dogs and humans, and most importantly, himself, form the subject of his fascinating book, The Boy Who Talked to Dogs, a memoir. Our guest is known all over the world as the Dreadlock Dog Man, and he teaches humans how to communicate with their dogs. I'm thrilled to welcome, all the way from Australia, author, dog expert, and media personality, Martin McKenna. Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Harvey. It is such a pleasure to be with you, and I love all your photographs behind you of the dogs. Martin, your book touched me so deeply and on so many levels. For those in our audience not yet familiar with you, I want to just give some quick background information. You grew up in the southwest of Ireland near Limerick sure. in a family of eight children. Your mother was a wonderful, compassionate woman, but your father was an abusive and violent alcoholic, and that would be putting it mildly. You were relentlessly bullied at home and school because you were a hyperactive child, which nowadays you believe would have been diagnosed as ADHD. You wrote that you ran away from home because you felt completely isolated and trapped in a bubble. Why did you see running away as the only solution for you? Because I felt I was at fault ultimately. I was the runt of triplets. And my father said when we were born that he should have um, drowned me as a runt. He said, you caused all the problems and therefore we should have gotten rid of you and we would all be better off without you. When you're abused and you have no recourse to anything, to any justice from school, from the outside world, from your home, everything can, can get really compressed. And the only way out was to leave because they weren't leaving. And... Um, Actually leaving felt like freedom, you know, like freedom that no more beatings. A brain can only take so much, Harvey, and uh, I've ordered with my feet. The Ireland of your youth that you describe in your book is a very rough place. Rampant alcoholism, domestic violence, child abuse, neglect, sadistic school teachers, gangs of boys fighting with each other. You even wrote about a couple of boys who tried to hang you from a tree. Why was Ireland such a harsh environment to grow up in in the 70s? Um, shame and low self-esteem. Um, because Ireland had been seen and labelled as the Irish people were stupid and they were useless and there wasn't much work in Ireland at the time. And what happens, the men in the household were being told by the churches that you rule your home with an iron fist. Most men took that license, and even Harvey, look, the, 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 the church was always next door to the pub. So the men could be told in the church that you're a man and beat your wife and beat your kids, and then you go to the pub next door after church, and you get drunk, and then you go home and you beat your wife and your kids. There was lots of kindness there too, Harvey, and one mustn't delve too much into the depth. So there you were at 13 with only the clothes on your back and six stray dogs that gravitated to you and kept you company. You had to steal food for yourself and for them and you found shelter in barns full of hay. When you first ran away, did you really think you'd be able to stay away permanently? Well, when I first left, I buried myself in the ground. I wanted to die. I dug a grave and I put myself in it and I thought I'd die with the freezing cold that night. So I wasn't expecting any long time anywhere with anything. I just wanted to die. It just happened, so it happened that I didn't die. And when I was in the hall, these dogs started to come around and they're looking at me really funny. So the, the dogs that I went on the streets with weren't actually wild dogs. They were just dogs that people didn't want anymore. And at the time, people couldn't really afford to feed dogs. So they just kicked them out. Um, where I lived on the railway line and around the slaughterhouse, there was a knacker yard. I don't know if you know what a knacker yard is. It's where diseased animals go when they die and are made into pet food, okay? Um, there was a lot of meat there, but there was a lot of, there was a huge guard dog there called Buddy. And so the dogs themselves couldn't get at the meat, but I could, because I was friends with Buddy, which made the dogs think of me as very powerful because Buddy wouldn't attack me. And therefore, 
they gave in to me straight away. And those dogs were so pivotal in helping me self-esteem. Come on, Marty, get up out of there when, I, when I'd be depressed. Because when you live on the streets, you're constantly in danger and you're constantly stressed and you don't really sleep at night. You sleep bits during the day and you don't wash and you don't eat properly. So you become pretty much very mentally ill. And the dogs would make sure that I get up and like some days I would lie in a shed for a week. And those dogs would be around me, nuzzling me and pushing me and telling me, get up, get up. If you don't get up and go out and walk and get us food, this thing is over. You have to stop thinking. You have to stop thinking as a human. You must now think as an animal. Martin, if I understood your book correctly, your family knew where you were because your brothers would occasionally visit you and you went to visit your mother at least once after one of the dogs died. Were you surprised that the police didn't simply apprehend you and deliver you to Child Protective Services? No, because they didn't do it with anyone. There was no Child Protective Services. There simply was runaways and there was more people than me and nobody looks to you. In a very poor society where there's very little love to give because there's very little food to give, things can go very much to the bone. And the idea that police now come looking for you, no, they didn't care. Nobody cared. There's a very sad passage in the book where one night, three months after you ran away, you were feeling homesick. So you went to your house and you looked in the living room window. You saw your family watching TV and they looked happy and content. You felt they were happier without you, so you left. Martin, that's heartbreaking that you felt like such an outsider in your own family. I went to the house because you know, you need company, right? Everyone needs someone to hug them, Matt. You know, I was weak that night. I was really hungry that night. It didn't go well that day. And in desperation, I thought I'd just, you know, sneak up to the window, right? And I looked inside and they were all sitting down there having cake and tea and there was no one grabbing for food. There was no one shouting. There was no one getting beaten. And I stared and I stared in there. I couldn't believe it. And then it hit me. It's me, it's me, I'm the problem. I looked at my mother. She was smiling, she was laughing. My father was sitting in the armchair. Oh. Then, then it started to rain, so I thought, oh, you've got to make a decision right now, because otherwise I'm going to die from hypothermia, because I don't have a jacket, right? So I think, okay, right, I've got to get back to the, to the hair barn, or I'm going to freeze to death. And I got back to the shed, and someone stole my sleeping bag. Oh, God, oh, God. I ran around the, 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 the shed, and I banged my head on the wall so many times, and then I collapsed. And then I remember I woke up the next morning and the dogs was licking me face. And I was thinking, was that all a dream? Or did it really happen? Like, And that's what made me not want to really go back is, why would I go back and upset that family? Why? What? They, were, they, they put up with so much from me. All I ever was to them was trouble. And, you know, I have to own up to that. Like, um, Andrew and John, Patsy, Jackie, Michael, and Ingrid and Corinna, they never like done anything wrong, you know. It was me, it was like the same in school, you know, and the, 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 the day they had my dogs put down, right? I'm in school and I can't read and write, okay? And they're beating me with these leather straps with lead in them, okay? Because they said it's ungodly to be able not to be reading, right? And so one of them had a, a really good idea they were going to send me back to baby class to learn whilst everyone on, went on to high school, right? So they put me in this baby class and then the teacher's there saying, this is a stupid boy who needs to learn how to read and write. And so I, I dived out the window of the school, you see, and I ran home to my two German shepherds 
and they knew there was something wrong. They knew it. They, they, they immediately pick it up because they can sense all this stuff, Harvey. And so when I came home, and they're licking me in the face and they go, "What's wrong, man? What's wrong?" And I'm thinking, "Oh God, what have I done now?" And then the two teachers come drive up in the car, you see, to the the house, right? And they get out of the car with these sticks. And they said to me, we're going to beat you all the way back to school and you're going back to baby class. Well, something snapped. And I remember I had the two German shepherds by the collars. And I for God, I don't know why, I just went sick of them. And the two dogs attacked the teachers and they're trying to get back in the car. And I'm out there with a stick, beating them with a stick and they're punching and kicking me. And they eventually get back into the car. And then my mother was called to come and get me. And the police were called. And um, I went to school the next day after getting flogged. And we come home for lunch. And I could hear my dogs. I could hear my dogs screaming. They were being taken away in the van. By these guys to put them down. Because I said about the teachers. I couldn't believe it. They were my everything. I got them killed. I should have. I should have taken the beans. I was used to it. I should have taken the beans. My, what my mother said, go back to school, she said. She said, don't cry. She said, go back to school and hold your head up. There's nothing we can do now. The dogs are dead. It's your fault. And then my two brothers, they looked at me and they said, you're not our brother anymore. We don't want you anymore. You're too much trouble. We can't do it anymore, Mary. We're sorry. We went back to school and the teacher, two teachers, like, were back at school. And they said in school, like, everybody stand up. We're going to have a minute silence for the Falls dogs because that's my real name, Martin Fall. And then they started laughing. And all of them started laughing and my dogs they are just being killed. They killed my dogs, I'm going to kill them. I waited for that, those teachers outside after school and I challenged them with my hurley stick. Don't know if you know what a hurley stick is. It's a piece of wood with wire around it. And I challenged them to fight. I said, you fight me, you fight me, you kill my dogs. My dogs didn't even stand a chance. I said, you come fight me. And I went to attack them. And then they got me arrested again. Martin, that's, that is a heartbreaking story. It's amazing that those dogs knew you were in trouble and tried to defend you. But what you've done for so many hundreds and hundreds of dogs since then has certainly gone a long way to helping you heal from that of horrible course. experience, um, I hope. Yeah, every dog I see is, is is it helps helps me, you know, it redeems me. Yes, it's very redemptive to do what you do with the dogs. I want to ask you a bit about the secrets of communicating with dogs. For example, you've explained in your book that yawning is a very important communication skill, isn't it? It is. And do you know what? It's the type of yawn you do. What kind of breath comes out of your mouth? Right? I do tell people, like, if a dog is sad, right, think happy thoughts when you're doing that yawn, right? Because the smell, the chemicals come out of your mouth, the dog will smell that. And it will think, okay, I'm being communicated to, and what's being communicated to me is relax. Don't be sad. Everyone here is happy. Whereas if we went over and Molly cuddled the dog, and said, oh, we hope you feel better and we hope that's okay. The dog looks at them and goes, oh my God, you're afraid too. Does that mean we're all afraid? So without handling the dog and using soft words like, oh, it's all right, cutie, they don't really get that. What they get is your inner meaning, okay? Because everything is a chemical and they, they turn it into something in their head and what they, that's that kind of yawn. There's, another kind of a yawn and it's kind of like a mother does it and it's kind of like Row! oh and it's sharp right and that's my being saying to puppies getting really annoyed at you you've all now been given the last signal the next one that pees me off 
gets a nip over the nose. There is an, there's another type of yawn. It depends on where you hold your head. I, as a leader, when dogs are around me, I lift my chin up and yawn. Ah, because if I can lift my chin higher than you, that means I'm over you and my chemicals are falling on you. You must obey my yawn and with a simple blink of the eyelids, turn my head away. And it's also a brilliant way to get a dog to go and lie down. Because what you're saying is, yeah, you're not there right now. Oh, I'm tired and yeah, off you go. And it's these all these time-honored traditions of blinking your eyelids. Why blink your eyelids? Well, when you blink your eyelids, dogs blink their eyelids fast, what they're saying to you is stop staring at me. It's very rude. So whenever you see a dog doing this, please look away because the dog wants to know, can you communicate with me? Can you understand what I've just asked of you? You are making me stressed, especially if you're looking at me while I'm eating. And if I give you that yawn and you keep staring at me, we can have a little confrontation. The chins, another thing, okay? Chin up. Normally, if I'm coming around a dog I don't know, and I'm, I'm teaching people about teaching a dog not to jump up, simply what I do is I look up at the ceiling. And I go, oh gosh, look at that crack there. We've got to fix that crack in that ceiling. And my chin is up here. And as soon as the dog sees my chin that high and knows it can't get its chin higher, it just lies down. All these mechanisms of purpose to calm our dog. If your dog's not calm, you are not able to communicate with it. If you're not able to communicate with it, you're in a lot of trouble. I know a lot of conventional people who are top people say ignore the dog and all this, but I would proffer to you, ignore the dog at your peril because it is trying to have a conversation with you. Dogs are really good at making deals, okay? Once you know the few signals, now you can start to make your deals with your dog. So not so much dominance because dominance breeds dominance. But if you can communicate to another species in a calm manner, what it is you want and what they want and have a conclusion to that and come to a deal. I call that civilized, Harry. You also discovered that even though we see it in the movies all the time, hugging a dog is not something they appreciate. They see it as a sign of aggression, not affection. Am I right? Yes, and I'm sorry for all the people that really love hugging their dogs. I'm sure you mean really, really well. But you must understand that to the dog, by you grabbing it, if you look at my videos, when I hug my dogs, they slip out and they will not be hugged and they blink their eyes furiously like thus and then they start to lick their lips because their lips are dry, because they're hyperventilating, because they've given you the signals to say, gee, I don't want to fight you but then when we don't listen that's when they bump us with their heads and people think oh that dog is so clumsy it meant to hit me on the head yeah for sure it meant to hit you on the head because you weren't listening because you didn't understand that in the animal world that is a fight hold and there isn't any other way of putting it and um, Another thing, if I may have it quickly, a lot of people are want to scratch their dog on the chest, male dog, because they say to me, Martin, our dogs love it. That's why we do it. I say, OK, I'll tell you why they love it. A male dog, when it gets scratched here in the chest, first of all, lifts its chin up, tries to get higher than you, means it wants to be better on you. But there's one other thing. The only time it gets that kind of an interaction is when it's having sex with a female. So you're kind of giving the dog idea that you want to have sex with it. So that usually stops people from doing it, huh? They kind of go, oh my God, I'm just never going to think that again. So that's what's happening with the dog when you do that. You also learned that asking a dog to give you their paw is actually telling the dog that you want it to dominate you. Yes, yes. And um, Harvey, I'm old enough to remember when dog food really first came out in tins and that, and they had to make it very friendly, otherwise people weren't going to buy it because it was in a yucky tin, right? So 
they got the dog to give them the paw in a shake hand method, which was pseudoizing the words, thank you for buying me that lovely food. This is what the pet food companies did. In reality, what's happening is the dog is dominating. you. You're asking the dog to dominate you. This is why when people say, give me the paw, the dog will reluctantly give up its paw, but it will turn its head to the side. And then people go, no, you're shaking hands with me. You're supposed to look at me. And the dog goes, for Jesus sake, I'm only trying to tell you by turning my head that way, please, I don't want to dominate you. I do not know why you're doing what you're doing. It is absolutely ludicrous. We're both going to get trouble because I'm going to start that I'm better than I am. And then when I try the next step, you're going to get really angry at me. And clearly I said to you, that is a dominating position. Plus people hold the front of the paw and the dog goes, um, excuse me, I need that to run. And we're kind of, no, look, we can do this. And the dog goes, please don't do that. That's hurting my pad. And then they learn to growl when people ask them to give them the paw. You go into great detail in the book about how important it is for dogs to figure out their pecking order within the pack and to determine who the leader is. I love the part about how you had to learn how to become the leader of the pack you were in. Oh yeah, um, I went and got the food from Buddy and Blackie wanted to take it from me. Right? And I'm looking at Blackie and I'm saying, hey, listen, man, you didn't go in there and get the food. I'm the one who went in and got the food. And now you're trying to take it off me and say that you're the new leader of the pack? Not happening. We ended up in a confrontation with this black Newfoundland dog and, and I. After it, we became reluctantly pretty good friends. But as I'm the one that goes and gets the food, it is I the one who decides who will have it. I also had to show the other dogs, okay, that there is no confusion here. This is pure clarity. All watch what happens here. Please do not challenge me. Eventually, after three years, you were persuaded to return home because your mother was ill and you felt guilty about how much she was worrying about you. And you wrote that the dogs made you ready to face the world. How did the dogs transform you into a confident young man? Don't doubt yourself. Never doubt yourself. Um, always go for it. Take the consequence, but learn something from it. Get up and move on. They taught me not to delve into unlawfulness, all right? Okay, lots of my friends broke the law, or I took serious drugs. And these are kids, right? Okay, and died. One of my friends died with a glue bag stuck to his face. He was only 10. And the dogs taught me duty. They taught me honor. They taught me respect. They taught me um, admiration. They taught me, no, life is not a freebie. You have to be responsible for your actions. You have to go out there and do the best that you can every day. Um, don't wait for tomorrow to do something. The dogs taught me, be aware of how you live and who is exactly watching you. Now, Martin, before we leave your first book and move on to your other books and to dogs in general, I have to say that the reason I found your first book so important is not just because of how you learn to communicate with dogs. There's a subtext with at least three important themes. The first is about parenting children with special needs. You were definitely a special needs child, and I don't think you were advocating that the best solution for children in your situation is for them to run away from home. So what do you say to parents with special needs children? Um, you could be very surprised one day. My mother and father thought that I'd be dead before I was 15 from drugs or alcohol or whatever. Um, I surprised the hell out of them. I actually traveled the world, became a success, um, owned my own little property here in Australia. I, 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 I guess the thing for the parents to say to the parents is, don't give up. Don't give up on the young. Because what happens is, when your parents give up on you, you give up on yourself. When you give up on yourself, other people can use you. These people can be very bad. A lot of my friends broke on the wrong side of the law and didn't really gain anything from it but an early grave. You need parents of children like this. Try not to blame yourself. 
this is just circumstance. If I, it, it, a simple thing, right? Um, if my mother had known that Martin's losing the plot here at six years old and screaming at his mother about food because Martin's hyperglycemic. Nobody knew that, right? And so if my parents had known that, they would have gone, oh, Martin's not mad at all. Martin's just hyperglycemic. Because what would happen with Martin is I'd scream for the food and scream for the food, but then by the time the food would come, I can't eat it because I'm, I'm, I'm sugar crashing now. And then I would really start screaming at them. So there's a lot of things that, that kids, broken kids like us, um, like me, we learn. Um, you know, the, 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 the worst thing that I learned, my parents really loved me. They really did. Um, even though my father used to beat me and throw me in the coal shed and beat me with the buckle of the belt, that was whiskey. But my father needed, should have shown more responsibility. But these kids, don't let go. Don't ever let go. You will be surprised one day that you could, you could turn out the best child you've ever seen. I'm glad to hear you say that your father really loved you because the impression in the book was that he disliked you intensely. And some of the things he did to you, for example, when you wet the bed, were beyond cruel. Have you been able to forgive him? Yeah. I have to put you in a situation. It's seven o'clock in the morning. The washing machine isn't working. It's overloaded. The mattress is wet now. The sheet is wet. It's kind of like that tipping point. Do you know what I mean? That you don't need at seven o'clock in the morning. Everybody's looking for food. There isn't food. Why isn't there food? Martin had to loaf of bread from the inside out last night and put the cross back on the back of it. And now we've got no breakfast. Now Martin has wet the bed and now we have to somehow find to dry the sheets for the other two boys to have somewhere to sleep tonight. So you can quickly see how, like a runt, you kind of go, you're too much trouble, man. You're too much trouble. I remember my father up making breakfast for kids and, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, he did some brutal things and stuff like that. But look, Harvey, life is too short for hate. Okay? We must learn to forgive. Maybe his father did that to him, right? And maybe back then he really flipping did it to him. And maybe nobody told my father that you're not supposed to do that. Right? But here comes the charging knight into the story. I've got four children, right? They're grown now. My youngest is 18. I learned from all of that, never do that to your children. I love my children very much. Um, as a, from a street kid who had no education, who had to learn to read and write at 50, two of my kids are lawyers. And um, one of my daughters is a writer, and my other daughter is doing marine, marine biology. So I simply said to my father, Dad, give me a hug. It's okay. You could only go to this part of the journey. I understand that. If you'd have gone the whole journey, what journey would I have had to do? So I took up that challenge for him, right? And said, you're not a bad man. You've done bad things. There is a difference. The second important theme is the education system. You said that your teachers called you stupid. They made you feel like a useless, unwanted freak. You described your school as, and I'm quoting, the place that tried its best to crush every spark of spirit out of you. What advice do you have for school teachers in dealing with kids like you? I had one teacher. His, his name was Mr. Lahan. He was a relief teacher. He came into our class. There was about 10 boys in that class who really weren't getting what was going on. This guy came in with ACDC music and Black Sabbath and all this, right? And he would turn on the, the thing and he would ask a question. And for however long it took us to answer the question, he would hit himself on the head with a tin can, all right? And we would be watching this and we'd look at each other and we'd go, come on, hurry on, get it done. He's gonna hurt his head. He used cross empathy, not hitting us, but himself, and showed us that when someone's in bother, yes, we can gather together, surely we can come up with a solution, and then he's going to stop banging his head and play some nice music. He was only with us for three months, 
but I will never, ever, ever forget that man. And if there's any lesson out there to teachers, please act like this. Please, you don't know the damage you're doing. Those teachers used to sadistically beat me and molest me. And the reason that they used to beat me was to tell me to shut up about they were mol molesting me. Then, then they would beat me. Yeah, I couldn't tell anyone because no one would believe me. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. Um, I, I, I wreck families. I wreck everything. And the third important theme is bullying. Now, I was one of those kids who was mercilessly bullied at school, so your book resonated with me, Martin, very deeply. What advice do you have for kids that are being bullied? Bullying is an insidious thing, and I learned to feel sorry for the bullies um, because I knew that they were playing out a different trauma in their head, and they didn't have the cranial capacity to be able to sit down and say what was going on and kind of work through something. The things they did to me were were pretty bad, but I forgive them, right? Again, life is too short for hate. And if we are to teach anything in life, it is that people can have a second chance and they can try to be better people. And to those people that did that to me, I just simply say, thank you for teaching me something that I would never do to another human being. So what you did to me helped me look at other human beings and say I would never do that. I want to move on now to your other books. Your second book is entitled, What's Your Dog Telling You? I found it amazing yeah. that although we think we know our dogs well, we constantly misinterpret their behavior, like licking us or jumping up on us. They're not telling us what we think they're telling us, are they? No, let's take the jump up, right? And um, we all think that the dog jumps up on us because it loves to get up to our sides and be close to us. But what actually is happening is, dogs have got scent pads on the bottom of their feet, so when they jump up on you, they hit you with them. And when they do, they simply say, I am over you now. I've laid my, pa my pads on you. I've laid scent on you. So therefore, I am better than you. Good luck telling me what to do today. If he goes to jump up on you, you just lift your chin up high up in the air like that. And you just got, yes, no, not in a million years, it wouldn't touch you. And what I'm telling people is, when you're dealing with dogs, you really have to be a good B-grade actor. When you're doing theatrics and the hand movements and all that, it kind of mesmerizes them. When it mesmerizes them, they stop what they're doing. And so, ipso facto, you gain control. And so, rather than trying to be, <coughs> yes, no, we're going to do this now, the dog looks at you and he goes, I've seen it before. You are just trying to dominate me, and that's not going to work. Try and interest me. Entertain me. Now, you might think to yourself, the dog is asking me to entertain it. And I say, absolutely, yes. If you ever watch two dogs before they start to play, they will do a repertoire. They do all this, right? And that's to amuse the other dog. Whereas if they just stood there and went, uh, would you like to play? Yeah, maybe not. You're pretty boring. So when we do this, we must always bring out that actor, okay? No, I will not give you a tidbit. No, leave me. Or if you're in disgust, oh my God, I wouldn't touch. I don't want anything to do with you right now. Of course, we're not really believing that, but we're just using theatrics to show our dog this is how we can communicate. Your third book is entitled, What's Your Dog Teaching You? In that yeah. book, you say that dogs hold the key to human happiness and well-being and that dogs can actually teach us to be better people. How so? They teach us to let go. They teach us to let be in the moment. They teach us spontaneity. They teach us camaraderie. They teach us solidarity. They teach us rules. They teach us consistency with all these tools that we don't think fashionable anymore, okay, because it's old stuff. The dogs never give up on the old stuff. They want to teach us this is the route to happiness. You must be responsible for yourself. You must have dignity. You must work in a group. You must be happy in the moment. So be in the moment, be in the now. 
lots of people, they talk about Tai Chi and Qigong and all this kind of martial arts about how you're in the moment. Go and learn it from the dog or any other animal. You wrote in your book that dogs are like sponges, that they soak up our emotions. Is that a good thing? Yes and no. If you don't give them a break from it and you use it as a blue blanket, your dog will become terminally mentally ill. If you use it and jump out of it, your dog will see a process and will be happy that you've taken that jump yourself. Are there certain breeds of dogs that are better for different kinds of people? Labradors are great. All hunting breeds. That ironically, I find that bulldogs are really good for people. And um, because they look so tough and they look so ready for everything. But if you say one bad word to them, they'll start crying. And for people, I've, I've done an awful lot of work with aggressive people coming out of prison. And my books are in the prison system as well, teaching people in prison how to be a better person, how to not to return to this, how to get self-esteem going. And I kind of use all this stuff to, to, to help people like this. Do you know what I mean? That, yes, you can learn through different things. What do you think is the most misunderstood thing about dogs? That they can take abuse. If I could leave one thing before I die, I would love to be able to say to people, don't abuse dogs. They already take on our emotions so much, so much, and ask nothing back. And then when we abuse them, that, that it's, 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 please, please don't abuse them. Please try to simply understand them. I'm doing a documentary called Multicultural Dog, probing the idea that a dog can understand a woman from Tajikistan and can understand another woman from Israel at the same time. How is the dog able to understand so many different types of human beings from so many different parts of the planet and we can't do it to each other? They're trying to teach us to communicate on a chemical level. It has given up so much for us that it behoves us as human beings to understand that from the Stone Age, these dogs have been guiding us, teaching us, and keeping us with one hand on Mother Nature. So we kind of owe a huge debt to, to the dog, which never asks repayment, never asks anything at all. The only thing that it asks is, is what I used to ask when I was a child. Could somebody please understand me? You want happiness? You want serenity? You want communion with your fellow human beings? Well, do what we dogs do, communicate in a civilized manner. And no, we do not use violence. Humans use violence. We blame other species and we say that we've progressed from that state of violence, but animals don't use violence. They just find food. Martin, I have to ask you about your hair. You are known as the dreadlock dog man. In your book, you wrote that you've always equated hair with freedom. Why? And my father used to give us all shaved heads. He used to shave our hair for punishment. And we'd go out on the road with shaved heads and people would laugh at us. Another quick reason was when I first started working with dogs, um, I'm pretty frightening looking because I've got a lot of scars and everything, you know? People used to say to me, oh, if you dress in nice shoes and, and clothes, you'd be okay. And I thought, that never taught a dog anything. So I thought I'd just grow my hair and be as unruly as possible. One last thing, it's a historical thing. These aren't dreadlocks, these are warrior locks. Okay? I'm a Celt and in my culture, when we go into battle, we cut pieces of all our children's hair off and our, our woman and we roll it into our hair so that if we die in battle, our children are around us and our wife. Wow, that's amazing. How many dogs do you have now, Martin? I'm fostering five dogs, and I suppose I own them now. Oh, no, you can't own a dog. That's true. Um, I've got seven. Do people leave stray dogs at your house? Yes, they do. And I get, I'm, I'm kind of glad they do in one sense, but then I get a, kind of annoyed in another sense. And so far as that's all you can say is goodbye to the dog. You just tie him up to a fence. I'm glad to do, Harvey, right? Because I have 15 acres of land, okay? 
and the authorities don't know how many dogs I have, so I don't care. Um, whatever dog needs help and comes to my place finds a home. Well, Martin, this discussion about your life and about man's best friend has been absolutely fascinating. I think every dog lover can learn a lot from you, and I thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. The dogs of the world would like to thank you so much for allowing them to have a little say about how much they admire, love, and want to be around us. You are now, sir, being given the status of honorary dog. Harry, I've been interviewed by thousands and thousands of people all over the world, the BBC World Service, every one of them. You, sir, are it. You make people feel comfortable. You make them feel relaxed. You ask questions that make them feel important. You, you give your smile kind of like disarms people. I was a bit nervous coming on here tonight, right? I've done lots of interviews and I was really nervous because I've I, I watched you. You're like Dick Cadet. Do you know, you know Dick Cadet, huh? Yes. You are a brilliant interviewer, man. And you know what's the best part of you? Your smile. You have a smile that just goes boom. And so much I don't know anybody who would come on your show well, you've got it, not me, man. I'm just complimenting you. Well, I want to thank you so much for that. You're uh, you're making me cry here. Well, thank you very much. And I want to bark my thanks to you <laughs> for being on my show and staying up very, very late in order to do this because you're in Australia. Thank you, Martin, for coming on the show. Could I say one last thing before I go? Sure. When I was a child living rough in the freezing cold of winter, I would scrunch up, curl up, close my eyes tight and pretend that I lived in the sun, somewhere in the sun and people liked me. I got it, Harvey. I live in Australia where the sun shines all the time and people like me. So be careful what you wish for people. You might just get it. Thank you, Martin. Our guest has been Martin McKenna, the dreadlock dog man. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thanks to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.